Hello, and welcome back to the State Farm Analyst Desk as we gear up for our next bout of the day. It's Cloud9 up against EDG. Our first look at EDG here in the second round, Robin. And so I want to start with this org because of how historic they mm -hmm. are, but not just the org as it's as a whole. I want to hone in on one of the players specifically who's yeah. been integral to that success in the journey of this EDG roster, Mako. Yeah, so let's talk about Mako a bit because he means a lot to this team and their overall play style, right? When he debuted with the team in 2015, it was about him and Clearlove kind of making plays. They were incredibly bot lane focused. And Mako actually did an interview where he said, unironically, if we do not get the tier one bot turret down before 10 minutes, it is a failure. Whew. And that is how oh, focused, bar. yeah, that's how focused they were on this 2v2 clear love would continuously path bot side. And I think even in a post clear love era, Mako is really helping carry the legacy of that. He can play both enchanters and engage supports, but this exactly is why I want to see him on things like the Thresh, things with initiation, because he, in my opinion, has the best initiation sense of anyone on EDG. And I think the really interesting thing is that as he was about to join EDG, Mako was known as the guy who could roam a lot as well. Like back mm -hmm. when he was coming in from the LDL, and I think that's a little spice of life that we got to see against C9 as well, is that he was roaming on the Thresh. He was making plays around the map. So it's kind of gets you a support who can do both, right? Play for yep. the 2v2, but also able to have that impact when they go out on the map. Uh, well. And you saw that footage there uh, of the way the game looked way back in the day when Mako joined the Ooh, roster. Yeah. That's, <laughs> how, that's how long standing a member Mako has been of this EDG roster. Plenty of titles and successes to his name. Looking to put another world title, though, onto that belt. We'll see if they can get it done as they go up against Cloud9 here, looking to accelerate their way to the knockout stage. So, how did it go before? <laughs> Not so great for Cloud9, I'll well, tell you that much. That's what we wanted to highlight, right? Was how good Mako was in this game because it felt like he was at the get-go of a ton of these early skirmishes mm -hmm. that got these leads for EDG and in particular getting these big leads for a scout as well that he was able to then power through. And I felt like for C9, it was not being able to control Mako on the map, not being able to control these mid and top side skirmishes that were happening that very quickly snowballed the game out of control. Yeah, and I think the big thing in going up against um, C9 and e like with EDG and C9 going up against each other, I think Yumi is also going to be an interesting thing to look at as well because obviously Mako is coming off of having a Thinking really good cat. game on that too. Um, <laughs> so, you know, when we, when we look at how this has gone, again, Mako can play both styles. I just vastly prefer him on engagement. And a bit of a different look of their first meeting. Uh, we're taking a look at Scout and all that he was able to get done Dagged. Important to note that he is one of our affected players when it comes to COVID. So while he had a monster showing the first time around, we'll have to do the same, but this time from isolation. And that's where it's really going to be tough for EDG because I love the way they did play around Scout's pressure in the mid lane on the Azir, right? Setting up for a ton of play, setting up for Mako to consistently roam towards the mid lane to get Scout ahead. And now that he's not going to be playing as much with the team since he will be in isolation, I think that is going to have a big effect but also just the fact that we're like when we look at cloud nine earlier today jensen was huge mm -hmm. against humanoid yes. he had a fantastic game in the oriana so if scout now is going to be taking a step back jensen is taking a giant leap forward i expect c9 to try and put a lot more pressure towards that mid lane once and with it that being such a power pick for them, I am wondering like how if this affects fans, right? Because again, this is something that Jensen will lock in when they're just like, okay, we want to win now. Like I know Jet has even talked about it uh, from Jensen's history with him. So this becomes a really, really key matchup with Scout playing from isolation. Where's the Azir gonna go? Is Jensen gonna lock in Oriana? Are we gonna see a rogue zillion pop in? Like, we don't know. Definitely, and while and while game one of the day today was definitely a momentum builder for Cloud9, I think it's a completely different approach you have to take to this EDG roster. Again, uh, just the idea that we were looking at Thresh highlights from their first meeting, but you still have to consider Yumi to be impactful. Mm -hmm. What can Scout get done and how will Jensen match up to that? I mean, it just, I, I don't really know exactly which lane you need to be the most worried about if you're in the shoes of Cloud9. Well, I think for C9, it's again kind of going back to what we talked about with Emily earlier on, was like, go back to comfort, go back to late game scaling, take the fight to EDG, because what we saw was when EDG played against T1, some of those skirmishes didn't go their way, right? We saw Viper getting caught out of Rift Herald, we saw 
draw. Their team fight's going heavily in favor of T1. If you go back to that style of C9, that's almost the problem point for EDG that you could look to exploit. Yeah, I was going to say, we've both seen a lot of EDG yeah. in the LPL. We know that sometimes if you pressure them like this, they will take the fight anyway. And it doesn't always work out so well. Yeah. So that is another thing that C9 could consider going into this matchup. If they want to force those fights and they're in a better setup, that could end up working out well for them. And again, just to re-hit, kind of one final point is, of course, the stakes. For EDG, they want to keep pace with T1. Put a win up here, you match them at 3-1 and for Cloud9. It is necessary that you win every mm -hmm. single game throughout the day to even hit that three-win mark and have an opportunity or a shot at a tiebreaker. So pressure becomes a part of this conversation, right? And and that's where it's like, I will almost always lean on a team that's basically as storied and as successful as EDG to live up to the pressure. We'll see if C9 has what it takes to dismantle them here as we're back over to Captain Flowers and Cajal for the call. Hey, we're back to us. I'm Captain Flowers, that's Cajal. And this is now the second of many trials for C9 and for EDG. Yep. Their fate's still in their own hands, man. They're coming into this 2-1. They can be tied with T1. They can do whatever they want if they can find the game plan. Yeah, three wins always the sweet spot, and EDG sitting at two right now. So if they win this game, T1 and EDG are at three wins, and C9 will be at one with only one game left. So C9 is out if they lose this game. They need to make the 3-0 happen to have a chance of getting out of this group. They've taken down Fnatic, they've got EDG, and if they can beat EDG, the last boss will be T1. It's an incredibly arduous task. It is a mountain to climb. You can see on your screen right now, this might be a North American event, but the Chinese fans, the LPL fans, are always here to cheer on their favorite yep. players and cheer on EDG. They're out in force with all the signs, loads of EDG banners and flags, and. Viper signs, or scout signs as well. So a lot of support for them here in the crowd, um, but a lot of pressure on C9 to pull this off. C9 will be on blue side, and we'll see how they decide to draft this time around. We saw a very scaling heavy front to back comp from them up against Fnatic. We'll see if they try to run something similar back. I think I speak for a lot of NA fans here. If we see a carry top and, you know, going back to their old formula, I'd be very worried for C9 because the formula they played today and showed today already looks like it's working. Yeah, it worked against Fnatic. It looked like an entirely different team. Let's see what things look like this time around. Cloud9 going to continue banning away the Caitlyn. They have focused this champion completely in the band so far at Worlds. Graves is also gone. Azir taken away by EDG. Yumi taken away by EDG. In this game specifically, I wonder how high prio Aphelios is because I think these are two incredibly talented Aphelios players who will definitely slam it on an early rotation if it's up. Another question is things like the Maokai. Uh, or the Sejuani, if C9 want to go into that wheelhouse. But the Azir is down. We saw Jensen's Orianna. So I think Control Mage seems to be working for C9. Okay, no Silas. We're going to take that one out. What will that final band be? Are we going to get another Control Mage? No, the Sejuani banned out. So that's one of those super Aatrox, tanks along yeah. with Maokai. Aatrox is up. C9 are immediately going to lock this in. As much as you might want Fudge on a tank and engage, Aatrox is just such a powerful champion. You cannot let it through. I wonder if that was intentional by EG, EDG in saying, well, or in Maokai, you can always get good engage on top lane from Fudge. We'll give you Aatrox and see what Flandre can pick into it. Maokai will be picked up here as a flex. It feels like a dare, right? Yeah. They're saying, okay, you've shown us that you can play one style well so far in your four games. Now we're saying you have to play something different. The Maokai locked in for EDG. They still have one more pick to go, using all the time so far. Oh. Do they just slam this down? Yeah. Yeah, they, they do. do. They're ready to go. LPL Fiora versus the Aatrox. Everything is so telegraphed. The chain snap back, the Q spots. Repost is child's play in this match. It's a skill matchup for Fiora. Aatrox can contest a little bit early on, but when it gets, when it gets to two items, it becomes really tough for the Aatrox. Similar to Fiora, similar to Camille. This will be Blabber's Trundle again into the Maokai jungle. Makes a lot of sense. Yep. Worked in their first game, seemed very comfortable on it. And we saw the power of it around Herald fights. Now, what does C9 pick up here? Aphelios could be an option. Could pick up some kind of Renata support, but I don't think that's very C9-esque. Mid lane 
control mage to stop Jensen from facing Victor or Yanabans could work as well. Zillion's being hovered right now. Not sure if you want to blind pick that, but it's going to be the Victor. Make sure they don't lose out on those control mages. Exactly, the Zillion pick, a pocket pick of Jensen's, a long time thing that can come out in times of need. Shouting out sort of Cloud9's backs being against the wall more so than anything, I think. But that Victor locked in. One thing I am very worried about with this first half of the draft from C9, the engage options aren't really there. You have a pillar yep. and that's it. So the second half of the draft, I would expect EDG to look towards some of those engage options. EDG themselves, they have Maokai there for the front line and then two powerful fighters, high damage melee champions in that Akali, in that Fiora picked up for them. So it's gotta be both of the bottom lane roles. I would expect here for them with the Maokai in the jungle. Definitely agree. And I guess the good news here for C9 so far is the Aatrox is playing against three melee champs. That really helps him in team fights and gap closing and getting resets and being able to heal through a lot of the damage. Aggressive AD carry bans coming out from Kalista and Lucian. The last one really is things like the Tristana, which we've seen touched on a little bit. We'll see if it's picked up or banned here in this series. Aphelios open, Varus is another one the teams have been prioritizing in terms of AD carries. Kaisa, another champ as well. There's the Jinx ban targeted at Berserker. I think Aphelios has to be a ban here for C9. Jinx, Aphelios, you would think, was the old school MSI trade-off, and it's probably the, one of the strongest scalers left. They could pick Sivir into it, but Sivir into Akali would be a little bit tough unless they can find some kind of peel support. They're taking their time. They really want to think it through. Plenty of options left. Marksmen have been pretty focused here so far, but there are still those options, like you're saying. Okay. Kaisa. I like this. It feels like a respect ban just towards LPL in general. Whenever I think Kaisa, I think LPL. I think Kaisa and Nautilus. Ooh. I think aggro bottom lanes, but it does leave Aphelios open. This is the pick you've been talking about all draft. They lock it yeah. in for Viper. I feel like Aphelios ban there could have worked a little bit better, but they're gonna give over the Aphelios and they have a plan. Varus Tom Kench here will do really well into Akali. Varus Renata would work too in denying the rot Renata from the Aphelios Renata. Now, Mako has a lot of options here. Nautilus would be the easy pickup to, the, to engage onto those immobile carries. Any hook champion to threaten the three-man ranged of C9's mid bot side works very well. We'll see what he opts into. Of course, Mako incredibly good at those melee support engages. I'm not gonna lie to you, buddy. I'm still really worried about this Cloud9 draft. The last two picks, yes, they have some hard okay. CC, but the Thresh is locked in for EDG, the Maokai. It's easier for them to sort of just start these fights with the engage. Renata's ulti moves slower than some champions walk. Varus has the chains of corruption, but they only hit one target. Cloud9 are really gonna have to find angles and picks here. They definitely are, and I feel like the Aphelios Thresh can be mobile with one another, right? The Thresh yeah. can always pull the Aphelios out of a bad position if he gets lanterned or if the Aatrox manages to get on top of him. But you were talking about engage from C9's bot lane. Avaris helps out a little bit with that in terms of finding those picks or finding engages around the team fights. I feel like a Varus ult into a Renata ult or a Victor W is their way of setting up through a Trundle Pillar. Uh, it's just a question of execution. I think we've got a very, very volatile top matchup the more the longer the game goes on. Mid lane, of course, Jensen will want to get the push, but Blabber will need to cover him. And bot lane, you mean you're playing four range champs down there, so push is everything. Blabber had a really good first game of the day. I complimented him during that game for being able to properly read Razor, always be there for the counter ganks, using that trundle effectively to change the way those fights would go. And now here up against EDG, I think he's gonna need to do the same yet again. C9 backs against the wall. This is the game that could push them forwards with momentum against E1. This is the game that could knock them out of the tournament. So much pressure on the line on the blue side here. I don't think we'll see any level one shenanigans. Trundle, of course, incredibly strong up against champions like the Maokai, yep. playing with Varus Renata too. So they could try to do level one invade towards bot side, but then you're splitting them up against Aatrox with Fiora. You don't really want to get into that kind of situation. We'll see what they do though. Here we go. C9 versus EDG. It is a must win game for the North American representatives and for the team from the LPL. You know they want to stay tied at the top there with T1. Find some of that domination. Let's take a look across the board here. All the teleports are ready to go on solo laners. Cleanse on both of the AD carries. They know that on these immobile champions, getting caught is a guaranteed death. Yeah, one hook, one kill could be. What happens in this bot matchup, Berserker needs to run that cleanse. Of course, Maokai Flash W is another one. The Gravitum 2 
Just making sure he's safe. That ward in the middle brush should help C9 get the early bot push, depending on where jungle starts. Looks like with Blabber being up towards his blue buff, that's where he will start. As I said, he's running down. Might go for a red start. Try to help Fudge out a little bit in these early stages, or maybe just do a full clear to top and then backtrack on the level three. Um, but the Thresh has a lot of innate kill pressure. The Renata more so yep. poke and push. JJ, Quartz. we are starting bot side as well. Renata does have the ability to find the bailout if the fights get really scrappy, really close. You can turn things around with that. But it's only good if things are close. If EDG can run the show, then it doesn't save a whole lot. Jensen far forward here in the lane, just having complete control over the wave. You can see Scout just sitting slightly out of vision range there. Now he's going to walk up, make sure he gets EXP, farm whatever he can. It's Berserker and Sven into the bottom lane first, but Mako and Viper can show up in plenty of time to not miss any EXP. And we're just going to start trading minions. Trading minions, jungle mismatch. Thresh will need that level two before he goes for any crazy old things, unless jungle's hovering around. JJ could be a bit crazy here and do blue drop into bolt with W, but looks like it's just going to move towards his wolves. There's the hook. Oh, finds Berserker, gets cleanse at level one. Yeah, Berserker just running past the wave there into EDG's bot lane's face and just starts hitting them. So Mako manages to burn that summoner spell, but C9 can control the wave because of this. Can use these early summoners to force lane push. Uh, and Berserker will have that level two first alongside Sven. Jensen similarly stacking these waves into the melee matchup. Can look for poke here. C9 is going to do their best to try to chunk Viper down. He's got a couple pots in his inventory. And Blabber, who's pathing bots on his three top side camps, will finish off on his red. Don't think there's any bot diving windows here. Maybe with an immediate support, they could look for some kind of crazy 3v2 dive. But we'll see what Blabber does. Still a long way away till the crab spawns, but he's moving his way into this bot side of the map. There's a ward that will spot him out. We'll see if he goes through lane or if he goes through river. Looks like he's just covering for now. Yep, making sure these guys can get this pushed up. That's the responsibility of the jungler in those situations. Ben is hooked. Mako sets it up. Viper knocks them down. EDG make them look foolish. C9 hovering for some kind of dive there, but EDG don't even flinch. Just instantly go on to Sven as he walks up and he was tanking the tower with the Ignite. By the time he flashed out, the tower shot was already in the air. He falls, and JJ's been full clearing all the meanwhile, while his bot lane has been winning. So great start here for EDG. EDG in the bottom lane, a 2v3, a pause. Coming off of oh, a baby. first blood at three minutes into the game with the money on Aphelios. Oof. So, yeah, only three minutes, 45 seconds into it. And the pause has come through. A lot of things to talk about, really, um, for both these teams, because Flandre, for example, this is his first game of Fiora in summer. Mostly leaning towards things like the Nara and the Gangplank. When you think of Fiora players, you think of players like Ale and Breathe and, the, you know, the Jaxes of the world. Flandre never really struck me as that kind of player. It strikes me as cre creativity and reliability. So we'll see how he performs on that champion. But it's an early bot lead, like you, like you said, for the side of EDG. And with that early bot lead that EDG did not have to commit extra resources to, they were the ones in the, the two versus three underneath the turret. Well, now that opens up the possibility of, hey, maybe jungler can just go top, help out the Fiora in this Aatrox matchup, really tilt that one in your favor as well. And then if things get dire in two separate lanes, all of a sudden you're just in total control. You are. And uh, when you think of Thresh, you can play aggressive with the Thresh, you know, ha land the hook, flash flay, you know, it's very aggressive champ, but it's also a very defensive champion in, in the sense where their jungler wants to play topside and get the Fiora ahead. With Bot having a lead already, what they can do is have Viper push out waves with the Lantern, you know, the Thresh quite far away with the Lantern at the ready, and you can kind of push waves in despite being in a numbers deficit. Uh, obviously, you can hover around mid in case there's a 3v2 as well. So we'll see how Mako plays the map, but for now, looks like we're in the pause, but we'll give you updates the second we know them. Yep, I've been told that there is some sort of peripheral issue on stage. League officials are investigating. I don't know if it's a keyboard, a mouse, whatever it is. But hopefully, we can resolve that one nice and quick, get ourselves back into the game. Cloud9 are down about 1,000 gold here early on just because of that kill. Mm -hmm. You're getting first blood. You're getting assist money. You've got the leads like you were talking about, too. JD just full clearing. He's like, OK, yeah. Blabber gave up some early efficiency in farming to try to move, shadow that bottom lane, protect them as they shove up. Mm. It ends up just biting them in the butt because of that thresh. Yep. And so things are a little problematic now. 
Yeah, it's great for JJ. And if you think of EDG and how their split's gone, you know, subbing in Junjia towards the end of uh, the regular season, fantastic early game standouts on things like the Trundle and the Poppy. And JJ struggled a little bit to adapt away from the Viego Wukong meta. Vi was his basic band-aid to fix those kind of scenarios. But the Maokai full clear is great for him, you know. Doesn't really have to look for anything crazy in the level 1 to 4. Doesn't have to overforce flashes. His bot lane's winning. Can do a very happy full clear and then look more towards the team fights. Of course, Scout. Has COVID in isolation right now, won't be on the stage, but hopefully yep. we get these peripherals fixed as soon as possible, and hopefully Scout gets, Scout gets much better as soon as possible. Um, but it's going to be a tough task for C9. Yeah. I uh, think top lane is where they'll now need to focus because the 3v3 just seems incredibly hard. Covering the Varus on pushouts, farming with Q max range, and then looking for Heralds on this top side is probably what their focus will be. And covering Jensen is really important. When Scout ticks over to level 6 on this Akali, they have so much kill pressure. You know, one Maokai flash W and he's as good as gone. Right. And Blabber needs to juggle the mid lane push towards a side lane so that C9 can play on two lanes. In their first game today, Jensen did really well on the Orianna, on the Control Mage. The Shockwave that found Razork in the EQ combo that set them up to get the Baron. The fact that he was always willing to aggressively trade to enable those Super Mega Death Rockets. Victor doesn't have quite the, I'm going to guarantee my damage with CC type of combo yep. that Orianna does with the ulti. But I'm still going to have eyes on Jensen to be that big team fight damage. And my concern more so is up with the top side. Aatrox is not a pure fighter, all damage, like I'm only gonna build glass. He's a bruiser by nature, but I find him closer to like the Jax or the Fiora, those fighters, than I do to something like an Orn. And Fudge looked much better on the Orn than he looked on the Jaxes and the Fioras in week one. So for C9, you're gonna have to enable him. You're gonna have to make sure this Aatrox can do his job because Fudge will need to step up, especially now that bottom is behind. Oh, he definitely will. And the Aatrox can run rampant in fights with a lot of mini champs. C9 up against three mini champs and a Thresh, which is relatively short range. So Fudge should be able to jump into these fights. Has a Renato behind him, has a Victor behind him. So mm -hmm. if he can control space for his team, then they will be able to be a death ball in a sense up against EDG. EDG's engage. It's it's reliable in, sen in the sense that you have a Maokai flash W, but it's quite hard to pull off because it's very um, it's very obvious when it's coming. You know, if Maokai stepping yeah. up or there's roots behind him with the ultimate, that's what you have to be scared of. They have a really good pick though. Thresh Maokai when they control vision in one side of the jungle, EDG will pounce on you. C9 need to be very careful. I think mid lane is like I said before, they really need to make sure Jensen's safe. If EDG have bot push and Thresh is hovering mid and Maokai's around on Akali level six, Jensen can't even walk up. He's even probably diveable at times. So yeah, C9 needs to get one side rolling as quick as possible. It is a terrifying situation, but as the situation here with the peripheral issue continues, we're going to toss things back over to the State Farm Analyst Desk. Thank you very much, Captain Flowers. Unfortunate pause here uh, between uh, Cloud9 and EDG. As was mentioned, peripheral issue. We've got officials investigating. They'll keep us apprised with any updates as they become available, and we'll get you back in the game as quickly as possible. In the meantime, though, we can talk about a couple things. Not just the draft, but first blood as well. Let's start, though, with what each of the team came to the table with, Emily. Yeah, so we talked about Mako's Thresh. He gets it here again. As we'll see later, it's a difference maker in He's that pretty good lane. at that, champ. Um, the other thing that you see from this draft is actually Maokai and Fiora being picked at the same time. So, you know, Maokai is going to be going into the jungle, Fiora going into the top lane. This isn't like, obviously it's, it's picked into the Aatrox first pick, right? Mm -hmm. This isn't a pick <laughs> that I would think of as a Flandra staple. Yeah. I'll just say that. <laughs> I don't know if you agree with me, Rob. No, I 100% but... <laughs> agree. 100% agree. This is not exactly a man who's very deft when it comes adept to like playing era mechanically skilled champions. He's much happier to play something like a Gragas, where he just play frontline. And even when we saw them win the World Championship in 2021, it was on things like the Graves and the Jaces, right? They're not gonna, you're not gonna well uh, with your mechanics on these champions. And that's where I think it's, it's gonna be a bit interesting to see how he's gonna perform on Look, this. I'm just happy that if there's a Fiora in the game, it's not on the Cloud9 side, okay? No. That's enough for me. Maybe we're learning. One to zero is the kill score. The teams are diving back into the game. So let's get back over to our casters for the call. Woo! Rock and roll, let's do it. We're back into game. EDG, 900 gold ahead. JJ securing the Scuttle Crab here in the top side river. Fires off that Scryer plant. Gonna see no camps currently available here in the top side for Blabber, who did start top, path towards bottom. And now up here in top side, Fudge versus Flandre early. It's a nice early lead for the Fiora. It is indeed. 10 CS lead will be able to crash his waves. Looks like Berserker and Sven gonna freeze this bot wave as Viper needs to base and pick up a couple of items. He'll pick up the Noon Quiver as he comes back to lane. Berserker gonna base on the freeze. Pretty smart to match, uh, or at least try to match 
the couple of the items picked up by Viper. Now Blabber's moving into this top side. He has backtracked, full clear towards bot, skipped Krugs, got the crab, and now he's moving up here. We expected him to move towards the top side of the map with the bot 3v3 now being losing. The question is, can he pull off a kill? The red buff's still up. Q3 from Fudge finds its target. Blabber's made his way in. He's just gonna out. step up. The infernal chains are already out there. The parry. It works. Scout's making his way up. Throws out the shuriken, and Blabber and Fudge have to back away. Yeah, Flandre using the W2 pullback there to stun Blabber. And I think he would have been fine in the 1v2 regardless, but Scout there has a lot of kill pressure if they overcommit. And look at JJ now from base, taking away Blabber's Krugs, taking away bot camps, putting vision down. Saplings in your bot jungle are always a pain to deal with. Not the start that C9 would have wanted. The control the saplings give you, just yeah. the ability to know when somebody, they're like a little mini ward, the power available to EDG. And now they're bringing a party to mid lane. Hey, Jensen, knock, knock. Here comes the LPL. Here comes EDG. Oh. Viper has two. The setup is just so easy, isn't it, with the Maokai Thresh? Just flash W, land the hook on his flash. If he doesn't, you'll chain CC anyway. And that's the power of the bot push we were talking about in the pause, that they can move towards mid. And because Berserker was freezing, that frees up Mako to make plays like that. Absolutely brutal for Jensen, who falls to the four-man play. He will hit level six first here in the mid lane, but there's not really an opportunity to do a whole lot with it. Scout's just going to get that wave shoved up. Jensen will fall back to farm. Flandre is going in topside. The repost will not find the stun, but the timing against those infernal chains is so easy. It really is, and as soon as that stun connects, he's dead, and level six Yura will proc all her vitals from her ultimate. She'll chase you down. So Fudge just picked up the plate of steel caps early on in this lane. Alternator for Scout with the level six. A lot of burst, a lot of dive potential. Here we go again. Are they going to be able to pull it off? Scout needs to crash the wave, so he has to invest a W for energy rage and to do it. Here comes JJ. JJ is ready to go. There's the chaos storm. JJ's low. Jensen looking for the all play here. Scout's at 100 HP, but Jensen's at 50. He survives the dive. Oh, EDG's mid jungle playing with fire there. The wave was so small. They only had a brief window before they started tanking. They don't manage to get Jensen down despite landing their full combos. EDG lucky to get out there. Jensen having to respect the smoke and back away. A shuriken tag means death. So he's just going to make sure that wave shoves out there. He's got very little health to work with. He has no teleport. Yeah. He's got Blabber right next to him to make sure he's safe. But they're afraid. They're afraid that JJ's regen on a camp and he's hovering around to stop the push out. Actually, they're going to stop their bases. They know they need to get this in. Scout hasn't yet based himself. So he needs to stay around and catch his wave. JJ is going to recall. So both mid laners able to control the waves the way they wanted. Okay, C9 will crash that one in. Jensen can get back. It won't hurt him nearly as much to not have that TP now. Blabber going back into his own jungle. As you can see, JJ's recall has afforded him his Ionian boots of lucidity. The staple for tank gameplay in the jungle going to allow him to make more of those moves. Back up here in topside, Flandre just continuing. Look at the farm, okay, till 69 to 49. Nice. The Fiora is just starting to run away with it. Yeah, almost 20 CS lead now as Fudge catches a little bit off that wave. And look at the minimap. You can see that ward on the Raptors, the red ward, that ping from EDG, as well as the sapling on the blue, basically gives information as to where Blabber is the whole game. As he blast coned over there around 10, 15 seconds ago, spotted by the sapling. As he walks into his bottom side jungle, spotted by the ward. So EDG have kept track of Blabber the majority of this game. Flandre is consistent top push, and the 2 0, -zero on the Aphelios is giving EDG a bot push. And they can always collapse towards mid. They can always hover towards Jensen's lane, and him having no flash makes the game so hard. So C9 need to force a play with a numbers advantage. It looks like the Herald is just going to get started up here on Vision with Mako in mid. I think EDG should be able to collapse here quite easily. Sven's on his way up. Yeah, EDG ready to answer this. Fudge still only has half HP in the top lane 1v1. Blabber has to get away now. Yeah, they threw the control ward down on top of the ward, but they still started it, like you said, with Scuttlecrab still there. Yeah. EDG was ready. Cloud9 can't just do that. And now JJ will keep planting these saplings every chance he gets, always on the lookout, always providing extra information as oh. Blabber and Sven step up. Blabber's getting grabbed. He'll probably just die here. Scout goes back in. They try to get him with the bailout. Instead, it'll be two. Sven with the flash oh. away. Mako, don't miss. 
Meiko makes it happen around the Herald. We talked about the strength of their picks from their jungle support, the amount of CC that they have. Meiko lands it onto Blabber, lands it onto Sven, gives two kills over to EDG, and they get the Herald as well. Fudge forced the base because he knows that his jungle support just died. He has no cover on this top lane. He could be dove at the click of a finger, so Flandre will get two plates. He's 30 CS up. The map is in shambles for C9 right now. Three and a half thousand gold at nine and a half minutes into the game. Cloud9 is getting absolutely destroyed here by EDG and by Mako on this Thresh. It was the final pick of the draft and it is paying off. Let's watch again. Really monstrous pick. Instant hook into the box. There's the Malachi Root. Glaber has absolutely nowhere to go. And then beautiful Mako sets it up next to Scout. Sven flashes, hook connects, two for zero. Happy days, and Mako is just such a standout performer, and he has been for so goddamn long. Seven, eight, nine years, just constantly at the top of his game. Hook champions, especially engaged champions, is where he shines, and we're seeing it right now. Total gold, you can see a lot of red at the top of that chart. Only just now has Jensen barely got a bit more money than the EDG jungler, and that will be a problem. As we head further towards the mid game, we still got three and a half minutes left on plates. But if we're talking plates, we're talking EDG hasn't lost a single one yet. Oh. Five, five, five across the towers. Dragon started up here, Viper is just gonna Pull it out as JJ comes from base to assist. Easy objective for them, both neutrals in their favor. We won't count that one as a hook, Mako. Uh, we'll ignore that one, you've done so well. We won't. <laughs> Missing the dragon is excusable. This is how he gets the bad ones out, right? Yeah. You just gotta, you gotta get it out here, yep. and then in the team fight, you're ready to go. You're locked in again. It's programmed to hit champions only. Exactly, that's not a champion. That's not gonna give you 300 gold. When you kill it, it doesn't matter. Dragon, slain by JJ and EDG, now with a four kill, 3.2 thousand gold lead Quick and the Drake under their belt feeling great and no signs of slowing down. Imagine your blabber right now. You're being pulled to every lane. You need to hover around mid to cover Jensen. You need to go towards top so Fudge can push out against his Fiora. And you need to make sure your bot lane can't be dove by the three mana of EDG or even get set up on, on a flash lantern gank, right? So Blabber has a really tough task ahead of him in terms of covering and juggling these lanes to make sure EDG can't find place. And I've got to compliment EDG for that. They're the ones who got themselves the Fiora pick into the Aatrox to always demand some pressure up there from Blabber. They're the ones who are hitting the hooks on Mako in the bottom lane to make that demand some pressure. Like, this is the squad who is absolutely just choking Cloud9 out of the game and making Blabber make these impossible decisions. The only option C9 have right now is weathering the storm through the lane phase and fighting neutral objectives. And Blabber needs to be on the top of his game to cover these dives. JJ's now up towards this top side of the map by taking that Scryers, I think. C9 will know he's there. Fudge trying to get aggressive on the Flandre, but the W stops the yeah. W from pulling him back. Taking away the blue buff once again. They have a three-man play here on top if they want to dive. Fudge, TP on Jensen. I'm not sure if it's up. Well, Fudge has two long swords and a pair of boots. Oh, well. Flandre has got a Divine Sunderer. That fight will never go the way of Cloud9. And now the Herald is summoned up just to beat him further into the dirt. First turret completely goes over to EDG. Four and a half thousand gold ahead. They're even gonna force the charge under the tier two. Fudge wants to try to stop it, but JJ won't let that happen. Glabber's around, Jensen's here too. 3v3 might be something Cena opt into. JJ slowed down here at the start. They don't wanna overcommit onto the tank, and EDG Walking out, but Scout's looking for a chance to maybe go back in. Not gonna find the Shuriken, so now they make their exit. Fudge paying a lot of respect to the pressure of JJ there. The second he got a glimpse of him, he instantly popped the ult and just ran for his life. Bot lane in isolation will be in favor of EDG. You can just see it by the item scale. Force for Viper can constantly push these waves in. C9 don't really have an angle to fight back. Scout a lot of kill pressure in mid as well. Oh! <laughs> The damage. Speak of the devil. Yeah, damage is absurd as much as... Oh, hang on a second, Sven. Tries oh. to flash and take Viper there, because he has no cleanse. He must have burned that a little bit earlier on. But now he's under threat if a hook hits. If Mako can land a hook on Sven here, he will fall. JJ now on the bot side of the map. Blabber was covering top for so long, he had to juggle his camps, but now JJ might threaten the bot dive. This is so scary what EDG has done in the first 13 minutes of this game. They got 15 seconds left on plates. They're looking to get a little bit more money. Mako just barely missing out on that max range hook there on Sven. That turret plate stays alive. Three, 
two, one. They hit the hook, but they can't go for the dive. C9 stuck underneath their turret all the way across the map. It's a 5k gold lead in 14 minutes for EDG right now. Every lane is winning or has pressure for kills. So JJ has a plethora of options. C9 is to hold on. One minute, 40 seconds on the next dragon. Try to take a fight when they have mythic spikes on some of their carries. Jensen doesn't get the base stop on the scouts. who will probably TP back anyway. Has the rocket belt complete. C9 have a little bit of room to breathe now that EDG have based on basically everyone. Coordinated reset coming out here from EDG, five-man base at the same time. The reason this helps so much is it helps you re-establish who you want to put where on lanes, right? Yeah. Scout's going bot, Flandre's going back top. We're gonna swap our minion bot and contest this dragon because we can get mid-push with Viper. That's why syncing your resets is so good, so you can change your control over lanes. Well, Scout decides to go in bottom. Sven's got no way home, man. All right, just, just make it quick. Make it quick. Oh. There it is. Scout picks up another one. Six, oh, five to zero, excuse me. Got a little bit ahead of myself there as EDG. Man, they just don't stop. Cloud9 losing Sven for free. Zero and three here on the Renata. They are ruthless, aren't they? EDG, the lane swaps coming through means that Sven gets caught out. Didn't expect Scout to be down here. Sven's struggling this game. And I mean, he's looking for a little bit of damage onto the tower, maybe for a support item or something. And then Scout flashes over the handshake and Berserker just got his recall off. Even if Berserker stayed, I think Sven was dead here no matter what. Berserker can't really offer that much in the Shroud. Yep. Scout will then net that and turn that into a bot tier one. C9 yet to find absolutely anything. Nothing whatsoever for the North American representatives. Remember, if they lose this, they are out. EDG securing the Herald for the second oh. time, getting away for free. The first Herald got them first turret of the game and half the health bar on the tier two. I'm curious how much they're gonna force out of this second one. They can just Herald wherever the hell they want, really. Bot tier two, mid tier one, Dragon's up, they can start that. C9 have no response. Fudge has the TP and Flandre doesn't, so that's a window for a 5v4, but they don't have any vision. I don't think C9 see absolutely anything on the map. Splabber's looking at this Dragon Pit blind and there's no real way to walk in. Thresh hook hits, a Maokai W out of the bush, you are dead and they have no pushing lanes to go through either. C9 will now finally get the mid push as Viper is around the Dragon, but Jensen's stuck under his tower. Fudge wants to push out top. It's a 6,000 gold lead now, almost 5,000 two minutes ago, a couple minutes later. Another thousand in the pocket of EDG. I mean, it's just so much at this point. EDG has to make some kind of an error. Cloud9 are at a point where it's just, it's not enough for you to play good. There has to be a mistake because the gold advantage just creates so much of a climb. The cliff is just vertical. It's only getting steeper and steeper and steeper. EDG will just keep choking you out of your own jungle and pushing you back. New York rallying behind, behind the hometown heroes. See if C9 can find any kind of strength, any power to fight back against this dominant, flawless squad of EDG so far. Viper switching over to the 360 no-scope guns. These ones can be very, very scary if you hit you with the ulti. Take out half your health bar with the follow-up auto. Oh, yeah. But nobody from Cloud9 is going to step up and challenge. This is so difficult, because if you're Cloud9, everything's pretty much a 1% play at this point, and you just got to pick which one you try to go for. Yeah, you basically your, your, your options get sh smaller and smaller. There's the Herald mid from EDG. Dragon's down. They're going to get this tower. Or are they going to look for a second one? Flandre has the TP coming up soon, but look at Scout. He'll find Jensen here. Scout seeing if he can get anybody. Oh, Jensen. Oh, no. Scout takes two-thirds of his health away immediately. Uses his ulti to do it. Gets the ult back out of Jensen. And now EDG regrouping in the Cloud9 red side jungle. C9, this jungle is dark and full of terrors. They must be careful. They must use their vision because what? JJ's saplings are winning the vision war automatically. Fudge going down to the tier two to keep that one alive, no. but he won't be able to do it. EDG still in control. JJ's ulti on the wall. Blabber gets free just in time to get out of the hook range. So EDG there pushed in mid with the Herald and we're playing mid to bot. They wanted to get the bot tier two and C9 despite getting towards the bot side first, weren't actually able to defend the tower. Flandre just steps up in front of Fudge and takes it in his face. You can see the gold leads individually across every single lane right now. None of it is positive for C9. Two minutes, 30 seconds on the next dragon. We'll put EDG on soul point. And I think the game will slow down a little bit now to give C9 some room to breathe, some room to find some more items on these late game carries of the Varus and the Victor. EDG actually trying to take away the blue for the third time here. Scout's coming around. He's got the ulti back up again. Blue buff at 700. 
Cloud9 still looking to control that, but it's JJ with the smite stealing it away. EDG has their support walking up next. They are three versus the four of Cloud9, but my money's on the three. They're just that far ahead. Baron up in 50 seconds. How quickly can EDG start it up? They have fantastic turn if they have some vision on this top side, and Flandre still has that TP, of course. Just about pushing C9 as far back as possible. Make them have to catch this mid wave. They have to run out of their own jungle. JJ and Mako will then start pressing forwards and putting wards down. And they'll just keep pushing you back. Take that pink ward. Viper controls the mid wave. Baron up in 30. We'll see if they decide to start it up. I think the easy play for EDG here is just a shift from bot to mid to top to try and take that top tower. But Flandre might be thinking of some kind of dive. EDG, they're starting it off. Going for the Ophelios ulti. Lockdown happens with Berserker and Zvenner both safe. Flandre versus Fudge off to the side isn't going to result in a whole lot, but Mako, he just doesn't miss those. It's a kill over to EDG, but Mako's going to die. They find another one as EDG kills Sven. Two for one now here in the mid lane. Support jungle for C9 is down. Sven tried his best there the second that EDG engaged onto Blabber to ult flash onto Viper, but he has to cleanse the second it landed, so he managed to get himself out of there. Flandre looking for the enemy red buff that's spawning in around five seconds time. He's gonna fight onto Fudge. Fudge trying to deal with this Fiora, but it ain't working out so hot. He'll walk away from it, but he doesn't have a lot of HP to work with. They can pass the red buff off to Viper so easily. The entirety of Summoner's Rift is owned by EDG because of Mako hitting hooks like these. Pulls Blabber in. Viper dishes out the damage. There's the ult flash from Sven to try to land onto Mako and Viper. They do get Mako down, but Viper with the Gale Force forwards just absolutely melts through Sven. And then EDG decides to back away. Mana bar's extremely low and wants to reset to pick up items. Ooh, that hook doesn't connect. 30 seconds on the dragon. Flandre looking for Sven here. Sven, no flash. Doesn't have vision on him just yet, Flandre. But again, like you said, owning every side of the jungle. 9,000 gold, 21 minutes into the game. 7 to 1. EDG looking incredible here in their first game of week two. And JJ with control over that dragon pit. He's got the opportunity to throw more saplings down, more control, more vision, more information, more, more, more for EDG. And they're gonna bring more bodies down to the bottom lane and look to give more deaths over to Cloud9. Malachi ult hits the front line there as Fudge shows up. Flandre taking a little bit of damage, not worried at all. Dashes back out of the chain. Viper goes oh. to the ulti. He hits five. A lot of damage flies out. Berserker's already low. EDG have them trapped. Blabber tries to get back to the rest of the team. Scout goes in. C9 oh, are stuck in the execution alcove. And EDG just got five for nothing. C9 are wiped their hopes and dreams are crushed as EDG circle around them like sharks and pick up all five kills. They're gonna put themselves on soul point as well. The nail in the coffin would be the Baron, but EDG can't pick it up just yet. Kato, these guys are playing like they've won worlds before or something. <laughs> You'd have thought, huh? You would think something like that might have gone down and EDG are making absolute Meet out of Cloud9 here in this game. 12,000 gold up, Soul Point, Baron's the next stop. These guys are a machine. They really are, and they're bloody well oiled. I mean, it's C9 trying to contest this Soul Point, so Fudge TP's in. They try to zone away Flandre, but look at the pincer they have here. Two from topside, Flandre from the right, Scouts from the left. They have nowhere to run. It's only the alcove in terms of space that they can work with. Viper then steps forward and starts hitting the front line. Good W there by Flandre to stun out Fudge but the Renata ult misses Scout, manages to dodge away, and it's him who just deletes straight through Fudge and Berserker with the R2. And when Berserker falls, Viper can step forwards, and all of C9 fall. What a heart drop of a moment for Cloud9 when you're all stuck in that alcove with one third HP, and you know what's coming, and it's not gonna be a good time. It really isn't, so now it's Baron. 12,000 gold lead. C9 are still in it. They have one more fight left in them, but <laughs> it's gonna have to be a miracle if they want to turn this game around. They're gonna group up, though, because they know the only way to win this is just numbers advantage. They're looking for Viper. Oh, Sven's in some trouble, though. Viper getting a ton of damage. Viper getting away. Cloud9 getting crushed. EDG get a double kill back over onto their AD carry, and Cloud9 won't find a single man. C9 play aggression despite being so far behind. They tried to get the kills. Jensen, Scout just looking to style on him a little bit. 1v2 gets it done.
EDG will get the Baron off that almost certainly, and C9 lose four. They tried to just overcommit topside and tried to kill Viper with three members, but Viper has the subs up. He manages to get out. That was just a throw everything at the wall and see what sticks kind of moment, and EDG slapped everything away and nothing stuck. Baron for EDG, Flandre is pushing in mid. C9 have nothing left. It is 15,000 gold. Nearly a 1,000 gold lead for every kill they've got in this game. 16 to 1, the kill count for the reigning champs. As C9 tried to make a move, and EDG just wouldn't let him. Berserker just ult flashing forward there onto Viper, trying to get everything on top of him. But the bailout doesn't come up, come through in time because he can't get the kill. Viper kites him out. Blabber is then stuck after Blast going over without the flash, gets melted by EDG. Flandre TP's in to help out his team. And I think that was the last play C9 really had to find a way to turn this game around because Jensen fell, the Baron's gone. There's nothing for C9. And at this point, if you're Scout, you're just letting them know. You're making a point out of it, 1v2, diving through there, finding the enemy mid laner. Uh, I mean, Blabber knows it's over right there. Yeah. Just seeing if something works. 0.01% chance yeah. this time around EDG are flawless. You're just throwing the ball all the way down the field. You're, you're just going for that Hail Mary. Yeah. It doesn't work. It's not like it was expected to. Fudge goes through the hex gate. He's immediately killed. Spins out next. Berserker's gonna drop. Scout gets away. EDG, they're marching to the win. They're about to knock Cloud9 out of the tournament. Flandre is running forwards, pushing the mid jungle of C9 back. There is nothing left to do here. It's all EDG. EDG, there's the inhib in bottom. They're going to pick up a second inhib here in mid. They've got the Baron up wave. Two left on Cloud9 side. And Blabber and Jensen can not do it. The reigning world champions will eliminate North America's best international team from world. And what a way to do it. EDG, incredible game, consistent, no real mistakes at all. Very clear game plan, didn't even give an inch to C9 to find their way back into this game. This group's shaping up to be very competitive now in the sense that EDG and T1 are at the same amount of wins. And if Fnatic lose to EDG, then they are also out. So Europe has their backs against the wall. And going up against this team, oh. this one we just watched right here, these five guys, that is terrifying oh, if yeah. they continue playing like this. The draft was set up great. We've got a counter pick top, we don't got to worry about it. Bottom, we got a playmaker ready to go. They counter the move from Blabber and just get the kill in the 2v3. And then mid, Scout's just ready to scale up here on this Akali. He's always a threat against the Victor. They bring up the Goon Squad to take Jensen out as well. EDG had a plan from minute one. This is a thing with teams that are world champions. You make one mistake and they will eat you alive. That bot play for C9 was just about to be set up. Second Viper gets the kill, they push out their base. No place to be made for Blabber, he has to play topside. JJ matches him, he owns the whole map. And then once you have both pushed to mid, the Victor can't lane. So, one mistake just kind of snowballed it into a lot of things. And C9 had a couple of options despite that one mistake. I think there was windows that they could look for, but EDG is just such a fantastic team and not allowing them to get those windows. If there were windows, EDG just threw a rock right through them. Just broke the hell out of them. That was one of the most absolutely demolishing games I have ever seen. I got a damage dealt to champions graph here in front of me. And if you put together Berserker and Fudge and Blabber, you get around what Viper did somewhere in the neighborhood yeah. in terms of damage. They just controlled everything. Even the fight where C9, we saw the players laughing a little bit afterwards. That second to last fight up in the top side, just running after him. All right, guys, just throw the, throw the kitchen sink at him. Maybe yeah. we can kill him once. Yeah. Even then, he gets away. And that's the thing with teams when they're snowballing leads. The gold graph is just a perfect straight line, straight to the, the finish line. C9 didn't get a single tower, so when it comes to con contesting vision control, EDG didn't give them any cross maps. There was never a situation in that game where you saw, you know, Flandre hitting a bot tower and, and Jensen hitting a top tower, a trade of tier ones. No, that never happened. They shut down everything. Well, if you are not joining us in San Francisco for finals, you can experience Worlds with friends and family on the big screen. Worlds is going to be coming to select theaters near you. That's right, you, my friend. And you can use that QR code below us right now to grab your own tickets. We're working on setting up a Blabber interview right now, but until then, we're heading back to the State Farm Analyst Desk. Thank you very much, Flowers.
I'm not sure. I'm not sure this is working anymore. I'm not. Yeah, I, I don't know I, what's I going think, on. I think producers what's told me there's on? been huh? a little problem. What? Uh. <laughs> so, wait, hold on, hold on. Let me try this though. Oh, oh, that's the good stuff. All right, we still got two more teams. <laughs> We still got two more teams, two more days where NA can roll this one back. Unfortunately for Cloud9, this will be the end of their run. Still have one more game to play, but are mathematically eliminated from the knockout stage as EDG absolutely dismantled them here in this game. We'll re-hit some of the draft. I know we got to touch part of that mm -hmm. in the pause, Emily, but I do really feel like a number of these picks, in particular that Thresh coming out for Mako, really mm -hmm. spelled disaster for Cloud9. Yeah, and then as I talked about flexing the, or not even flexing, because they picked them together, but the Maokai for Jiajia and then the Fiora for Flandra. We had touched upon how that's not necessarily a pick we think of Flandra on. And I know, I don't know how you feel, Rob, but like obviously this is kind of a little bit of a different look from EDG than what we've seen from them at the event so far. Oh, definitely. Like even when you think back to 2021 Worlds, what EDG won with was team fighting, right? They were, mm -hmm. hey, we're going to dominate you in lane, turn that into dragons, turn that into a big team fight victory, and we're going to win through that. Instead, what we saw here was very much a 1-3-1 one, one composition, right? Where they wanted to try and spread out the map, they needed to get the ball rolling early, and as you pointed out, Dash, having this fresh step up massively for Mako was the big factor here that got that snowball rolling. Yeah, I don't even know how much 1-3-1-ing one, one they had to do when Mako's pulling off the kinds of plays that he is. It didn't take him long to prove himself to be the one-plus OP player of the game on this Thresh pick. He'll secure first blood, but he'll secure many after that as well. Yeah, and obviously he was a massive difference maker. Prior to this, they had actually already blown Berserker's cleanse in lane. Um, and then obviously it's for picks like this, right? Where he is, becomes a massive difference maker. Also congrats to Mako for hitting over 600 assists at the world championship in his career. That's massive. It's also the most all time of any player when it comes to wow. the assist category. Yep, and he, uh, he uh, eclipsed that mark in this game here. Yeah, and I mean, look, he was an absolute monster. And this is what I was talking about when we looked at the C9 game specifically for Mako. When he had the Thresh, it was less about the 2v2 that we know Mako for and playing alongside Viper. Like, he's got one of the highest duo proximities in the LPL. This was a very different style where he's roaming around the map. He's working with JJ. He's working specifically with Scout in the mid lane. And when you are this far ahead, it becomes very easy then for you to dominate through those side lanes, dominating those skirmishes. And it felt like every step of the way, Mako's hooks just were not missing. I was about to say, we were joking about it backstage. I really wish it was the thing we could do. We were like, we want that thresh yeah. hook counter because yeah. it pretty much felt like he was 100% hit rate throughout the game time and time again. Uh, but it's not just him, right? It's also about the players that he's setting up because it's wonderful when your thresh is hitting the hooks. Someone still has to be there to follow up. Someone still has to be there to be spoon fed those kills. And then as you said, Dag, they're kind of off to the races. But take a look at these numbers here for Mako. Almost a 90% kill participation, That's which is insane. massive. Like we've talked about, I do think EDG, despite the fact that Mako is phenomenal on Enchanters, I do think EDG function so much better when he's roaming, when he's able to initiate fights and skirmishes. Yeah, and that 90% KP, I love that it's called out because we talked about where those kills actually go, right? He's a part of them. But most of the time, they're going to one of his many carries. And in this game in particular, when we said it's going to be on Scout to show us what he's got, particularly from playing in isolation, and he does just that. Yeah, I felt bad for Jensen because we're like, you know what? He had a great game earlier against Fnatic. He just needs to try and keep that going here against EDG. And then it wasn't just one. It wasn't two. It was three people <laughs> consistently showing up in his lane and making sure that Scout could get the ball rolling. And yeah. I think Scout did wonders with this, right? Like, Scout has always been someone that if you give him those kills, like, on things like well, the Akali, but we've seen the Silas's, we've even seen the Azir in the past as well, where when he can get the ball rolling, that's where he's looked the best, and he just dominated from that point forward, consistently getting into the back line, hiding in the brushes, catching people off unaware, and making this game very, very easy for EDG to execute on. And through Scout, you can kind of see EDG's thought process throughout this game, right? Because Flandra actually had pressure in topside. Once they got bot lane settled, that's when Everyone kind of groups up, heads mid, make sure Scout is ahead, and he repays them with this phenomenal Akali performance. Yeah, and the big thing as well was because you end up with Scout so far ahead, made it very easy to get both these Rift Turtles. Made it very easy to get down side turrets, get down the mid lane, turn off the second Rift Turtle, and then you're off to the races here with the composition that they were playing. It becomes incredibly hard for C9 to try and control them when they've just completely lost control of the map. Beautiful game out of EDG as they keep pace with T1 at the top of the group, and they've likewise guaranteed themselves a tiebreaker at the end of the day. But for now, we are joining Shox and Blabber on stage for our Verizon post-game interview.
I'm here with Blabber at the BSI interview area after unfortunately C9 uh, is done here at the World Championship. I want to start with this game versus EDG maybe, um, as I believe you got a lot of momentum from the earlier win versus Fnatic. So what's your read on what didn't go too well in this one? I think we just had a really rough early game. This one, I think that I, st I think that we could have dove bottom if uh, I just came through the lane and uh, obviously unfortunate that Sven got hooked, right? But I think there was a chance we can zone them or uh, try to dive because we thought Malkai was pathing top. Um, and then after Zen died, Thresh was able to get a move mid. Um, and he was able to kill Jensen and then it, it was pretty hard to kind of play after that point because we don't really have any way to really catch their champions, so. Yeah, we just got behind and lost. Yeah, it was a, a difficult one indeed. When you look at everything holistically, you were kind of put on the back foot even before coming into the second group phase. To what do you attribute that if you look at the whole performance? Uh, honestly, I think we just weren't that good this tournament. I think that we had a lot of weaknesses and we weren't really able to kind of figure out what we wanted to play early enough. I actually think that we were able to kind of figure out what was working for our team this week, but mm -hmm. I think we were already down too many losses, uh, and we would have to win all their games. I, I think we could have, but I mean, it's just unfortunate, right? We lost. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, is there anything you want to say about kind of the rest of NA? They still have chances, of course, in the next couple of days, and you got the first one on the board, so here we go. I think the other NA teams are are not bad. I, I do think that they can also pick up wins, and you know, I'm rooting for them to make it out of the group. I really, I really want my region to do well, so um, I'm wishing them the best of luck. Okay, cool. Thank you so much, Blaber. Thank you very much. Never easy to have a conversation like that as you're uh, staring down the exit of your own tournament. Still one game left to play for Cloud9. We'll hope they can end on a high note. Uh, but in reflecting on their journey here at Worlds, I think that game one of the day is what a lot of people are going to point to and say, that's the Cloud9 we know. That's the one that qualified to the tournament. It's just a little bit of a bummer, maybe a slight misread on the meta early on that kind of took them on the wrong path. And therefore, it took them a little while to get back, uh, you know, to the right the right way. Yeah, I definitely agree, especially when you look at how dominant they were in the, the finals, right? Especially when it came towards how they set up for objectives, how they played these late-game team fights, and that was the Cloud9 that I expected to see coming in, and it just felt unfortunate that they couldn't really get to grips with what was actually the meta coming into this event, mm -hmm. and it felt like, as you say, they were two steps behind and then had to play catch-up the whole way along. That's the importance of performing in week one of groups. You want to give yourself those cushions so that you can get it done here in week number two. Now, while the competition so far has been monstrous, one hunter is ready for any beast he might face. Check it out. Another dawn brings a new day to continue the hunt. My ancestors built Nazuma away from the Ascended and other would-be rulers. But monsters come in all shapes and sizes. I, Kasante, stand between them and my people to the end. 